Hi everyone, um, welcome to the NHSR webinar for June. Uh, we have today with us uh, Robert Clotins, who's going to be talking about Lyme Survey um, to collect data over the internet. Funnily enough, I looked at Lyme Survey myself a long time ago, it must be, oh, I don't know, at least seven or eight years ago, I think. Um, and it was very complicated and I sort of uh, was too frightened to really, to really dig in. So I'll be interested to hear um, how um, to use it. Um, just before we kick off the webinar, I just wanted to do a quick bit of NHSR news for you all. Um, so we do um, have abstracts for the NHSR conference. We, have our, our, we are open at the moment for abstracts. The closing date is this Friday, Friday the 23rd of June. Um, so please do um, put uh, abstracts in. We are having Python and R on the main stage today, unlike last year where Python and R were separate, they are all together today. So we're looking for workshops, lightning talks, longer talks uh, on the subject of R and Python and related matters. Um, I'm sure someone can very helpfully put a link to the abstract in the chat while I'm talking or after I've finished. Um, and the conference itself will be face to face on the 17th and 18th of October. And we have a variety of other online events happening um, throughout the month of October as we usually do. Um, just a couple of ways of just keeping up to date with the community. Um, so please do visit the uh, blog section. There's several new blogs up at the moment. Um, we are on Twitter and we are on Mastodon on the Fosterdon server. So do come and visit us there. Um, and also um, we have a podcast. We've just published a newscast podcast um, and there is another one uh, on the way soon with a special guest from NHSR. You can find it, as they say, on Apple and Spotify and wherever you get your podcasts. And we have um, an intro to Python course um, on the 29th of June. I believe it's running over two days, 29th of June, I think it's the first one. Um, so do go on our website and look at the events tab to register now. Right, thank you very much. With all that said, I'm going to unshare my screen and hand over to Robert, who's going to talk to us about Lime Survey. Okay, should I be talking now? Yes, please. Oh, okay. hang on. No, sorry. Um, we just need to get Robert's up, I think, do we, Kayleigh? Oh, here he is. All right, okay. Thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's my first time on webinars and also in HSR webinars, so um, that's uh, my excuse if anything goes wrong. But uh, what I want to talk about is uh, about a way of uh, collecting data and interfacing it was our quickly and hopefully towards the end of it there also might be other thoughts. I have not prepared slides because I believe it's actually much better to show you real working examples. So I'll be showing some browser pages and um, R and what's happening inside R. And uh, I don't know exactly what's a mechanism of feedback or asking questions is, but what I will assume that people who have questions uh, or who want to clarify something somewhere in the middle, that they probably can contact the organizers and they can intervene and stop my stream of words, which can be annoying sometimes. So here we go. I'll share the screen and talk a little bit about Lime survey. Right. So. OK. So here is the first one. And other things. Yeah, so Lime Survey is something that's actually written up on Wikipedia. And I do remember touching upon it briefly, uh, you know, maybe something like 18 or so years ago, and then I didn't touch it for quite some time. I really became very interested in it once I started doing something with R, which was about eight years ago. But here you can see that Lime Survey has been around for 20 years and that it has had solid and sustained development. From what I know, it is probably the best uh, open source survey software around that of course might be different opinions but uh, it really is quite good and i'll tell you why i think it's good so uh lime survey that's what it looks like that's what that is mm -hmm. community
Lime Survey has been so successful that they are also simply selling access to it. You can subscribe and pay some money uh, every month, usually about £30 or so. But you also don't need to do that because you can download the newest version and install it on any sort of web server that you have available. It only has to support PHP and some form of SQL database. Usually it's a derivative of MySQL. Uh, what's perhaps more important is that there are forums. Forums are very rich and uh, you can get lots and lots of answers in them. What you also can have is um, manual, which is um, Lime survey manual, yeah, question types. That's the usual place where I go to uh, when I need to clarify something. This is about various question types and how they look in, in Lime survey. Okay, now installation of it, if you don't really want to maintain the um, sort of infrastructure of your own uh, Linux server and or actually it could be Windows server and PHP, etc. You can usually do it in some shared hosting kind of thing. There are many things available. I used to use uh, I think a British solution called five quid host, which was really quite nice. So all you need to do is basically to install it here, you need to open control panel, which I click on here, see panel login, and then it looks like this. Then you go to applications and you usually use Softoculus apps installer. That's a pretty standard thing that these hosting solutions provide. And then you have plenty of stuff that you can install on your domain. And uh, if you go to Lime Survey, you just get to install it. And then if you click install now, you will be up and running within two minutes. Yeah. Since I've done it quite some time ago, um, I, I have it installed. So I show you what it looks like when installed. But uh, what I wanted to say is this. The cost is uh, whatever sort of uh, monthly or yearly cost it is that you pay to this provider. And usually it is something around, uh, it used to be something around 20 pounds a year or something, yeah? And then you also need to pay for um, a domain name, which is usually something around 14, 15 pounds a year. So those are the costs to maintain your Lime survey place somewhere. And individually, I have been doing it individually because I could see the benefit of it. But if you do it at organizational level, that cost is really very low and you can use Lime survey easily if you um, simply want to you know, maintain it as an extra source, as an extra sort of convenience place you like, you know. Basically what I'm trying to say, it's really very, very cheap to run Lime Server. It can be very cheap. There are two methods of updating. One method is you simply take the newest version and install it over, which is fairly simple. And of course, in such web-based solutions, you also have your file manager, you can just see where stuff is. And at the moment, you can see that Lime Survey resides in my main public HTML sort of place. This is, I think, or oh, hang on, no, this is, no, I actually put it in subdomains, I think. I have even forgotten where I put it, but it is public. <laughs> Yeah, here. OK, this is my Lime survey installation. So if I delete this directory and install it back, it will be there. Of course, it doesn't store any data inside the web server directory. It, of course, stores it in uh, MySQL database, which you, again, if you want to, if Lime survey access for whatever reason is not sufficient for you, you can simply 
uh, open it in PHP MyAdmin, which is standard tool for working with um, with with PH, uh, MySQL databases. And here you can see that's a database, and these are my my surveys and their answers, etc. Yeah. So that's what's in the back of it. What's in the front? is Lime survey. This is a screen which you get after installation. If you have some surveys, you will obviously have a list of surveys here. Yeah, but I wanted you to simply walk through with me how simple it is to create a survey. And it really is simple. You just need to say what your survey title is, and then your survey title will be, let's say, NHSR webinar, you need to give a title. Defaults are usually perfectly OK because there is nothing, nothing special about it. All you need to, to say is survey title. You can, however, have downloaded and copied somewhere the structure of an existing survey which you want to replicate on another Lime survey server, perhaps belonging to your colleague, so you could also import that file. Or you also could simply choose one of the pre-existing surveys and just copy it and it will create survey with exact same thing but with a different title. But here we are walking through creation of survey from scratch. So you push create survey and that's it. Yeah. And then the only thing that you need to do, because you can't really add questions unless you have question groups, which makes sense for larger surveys. Yeah. So the thing that people usually get sort of hang up is um, on adding a group. Now, in the latest version of Lime Survey, you can see that there is already a group created. Creating a group is as simple as this. And usually what I do, because I want to minimize the amount of text on screen, I simply create a group which I call main, and that's it. And I save it, yeah. This used to be case in previous versions, at the moment, you could see that recognizing that people are sometimes puzzled by not knowing where to add question, they have now helpfully added my first uh, you know, question group. What we could do with this, we could simply click edit, and then we could just edit, and we could say something. We could say nonsense, for example, you know, and um, we could just save this and obviously. So you select one of the question groups and I usually would have only one question group, which is called main because that name doesn't appear anywhere. And then I simply add a question. And when you add a question, you need to decide what question type it will be. And that's where Lime survey sort of um, manual really comes in handy. You can look up all the question types here. I usually use, I like to make things very, very simple for people. So I usually use some sort of long question, long text question, which is long free text. And that's that. And then I can say, what would you like to say? And then, if need be, I can also add some sort of help. And then I save the question, and that's it. Yeah. Now, another question type which I really, really like is numeric uh, question, because I like people to have easy way of inputting stuff. Yeah, and uh, that usually would come. So arrays are very good for various sorts of Likert scales. Yeah. So in multiple numerical input, if I select that question type, I could, okay, yeah. This was, yes, this was, an, I'm adding a new question. And as you know, I will select multiple numerical input. And that will be that. And then I say, 
port number, for example. And then I say save. And then if I get a little bit sort of uncertain of what's happening, yeah, I can always preview what I have done before. So if I can say preview survey, this opens with some sort of introductory screen. So I have to click next. And then there is the first example question. And then I can click next to go to the main group. Yeah. And here you can see some things that I have done. And if I click submit, obviously it explains me that survey is not active yet. But I want it to be somewhat more useful. So what I will do, I will first get rid of this question group, which I have called nonsense. You know, so we need to select that group. And then I am starting to see because obviously the thing has been updated. Oh, oh very funny. I am not exactly sure. Maybe it is some sort of screen anxiety, but for whatever reason, I think in the previous version it was slightly easier. OK, here it is. Yes, of course, they have hidden it probably to cater for mobile screens. So I will delete the group. Deleting this group will also delete any questions. Yes, that's exactly what I would like. And now I would like one more thing. I would like people to see this thing in just one screen. So under presentation, I will say, no, I do not want to show how many questions in the survey. No, I do not want a welcome screen. Uh, backward navigation, well, I will have it only on one screen. On-screen keyboard, no need. Progress bar, no need. Participants may print answers. Yes, they can if they like. Public statistics, well, if I really want to show graphs, no. And quite helpfully here, if people click submit, I can also tell them where to go after that. Yeah. Now, let's say, let's save the good work that we have done. And let's preview the survey. What have we changed? As you can see, we can immediately get to the meat of the matter. We can go to questions, yeah. Here you can see it also displays my group, which I don't necessarily always want. So there is a way how to simply show group name description. I would say hide both. I don't need group name and description. So now my survey looks much more like I want it to look. By the way, if you supply the link to a mobile telephone, like a QR code, this is fully responsive design. It looks good on your mobile device. That's why I really like it. So the last thing is I want to go back to question and just to say what I would like it to look like. I would like it to be a slider layout. And I think it is slider here, yes. Use slider layout on, and it's going to be a horizontal slider, circle shape, usually, the things are very, very kind of. So let's say slider. I want to say something between zero and 100. So slider maximum value 100 and slider accuracy is one. So it's a 100% visual analog scale. And we could say slider starts at the middle position. Yeah, and that's about it. So I click save. Let's preview the survey. Voila. You can just click, you can say hi and submit and it's all done. You have your responses. I'll show you in a second what happens with the responses. Now, sometimes as you can see, because I want least cognitive strain on people who are taking my survey, I actually might want to disable help. So that's also quite possible. You will see in some other survey how it's done, but let's now jump to R bit. Yeah, There is a library existing called 
Claudi R. Leimer, and I will make sure, by the way, that all the necessary links, they get to you as well through the management committee. So this is a library. It's quite old, but it's being updated. For example, when we discovered a little bit of a bug, this was corrected just six months ago. So people are responsive there. They describe how to install it. It's quite painless. Usually you install it with simply um, enabling uh, what's the development tools and you install from GitHub. That I think is the best way to do it. OK, let's go to R and see what's happening in R. Essentially, if you supply R with uh, the necessary data, for example, you load Limer library and then you uh, have something where your username and password is provided. And I usually hide it. I don't hide it for hiding reasons. I hide it really to not confuse people because I have uh, got it worked by clinicians who have, don't want anything to do with R, anything to do with programming. And they could be actually quite worried that uh, they need to change something in here. So they have done it quite successfully when I've said you need to open this particular script from there and when you need to press just one button. Yeah, if they need to uh, to to change something, they will do it in a kind of file which is script properties. That's why I uh, do, uh, you know, uh, load properties library. It's simply basic sort of property thing which gives property name equals to property value. So I put all things that need to be changed in that file, which is quite useful. Now, what happens with R? I will not bore you going through this step by step. Simply, if we press the button knit, we will see, uh, you know, something like a PDF file. At least I hope so. I was able to do it this morning. And so it should work, I think. Yes, here we go. Here's a PDF file. By the way, in case anyone wants to know, this is uh, an NHS computer that I'm talking from. Yeah, so all it is is R Studio and R are installed, and then we can install packages quite all right. Yeah. So the idea here is that there is a list of patients who basically every week they submit some sort of data. Yeah. And I will get you in the position of being this patient very, very soon. Yeah. Now, this shows how they have felt on the scale zero to 100 percent over the last seven days, because last seven days people probably can remember. If I ask them what happened, you know, one month ago, how did you feel over a month? I think those are much worse quality answers. And then we ask how many times you attended A&E, how many times you had police contacts these seven days and how many times you had crisis team contacts, you know. And ideally, of course, what we want is that uh, these lines kind of gravitate towards zero, towards end, as a result of our intervention. Yeah. Now, let me put you in place of those people. If people could try to scan this QR code with their mobile phones and just go through this Lyme survey thing very, very quickly, I promise it should not take you more than 30, 40 seconds. And my talking shouldn't be very, very uh, distracting because basically, A, you just need to me move one bead between zero and 100. Yeah. And then that bead, you also need to, uh, yeah, there are three more answers, which are, by the way, non mandatory. So what you can do is um, you can just leave default answers, but I would challenge you to enter some sort of proper answer, which is a, a bit bigger answer. You know, let's say I attended A and E. 35 times, yeah, simply to see that. Um, 
this thing. Okay, and there is a problem actually. We are trying to do some sanity checking and actually we don't believe if people have attended a &E more than 20 times. So we are saying please limit it to 10 or you know 20 or something. Yeah. Okay, now I have submitted my answer myself and I hope some of you have submitted your answers. And if we go back to the same file and if we press the knit button once more, we should be able to see the changes. And I know that people in here probably will not be amazed by it in the least. Yes, we can see some changes. Yeah. OK, crisis contacts. I'm really glad someone really put in a huge number of crisis contacts. I think that wasn't me. I did put in 10 a and &E attendances, I can confess. Now, what you also see here, if you ever demonstrated to people that you have a bit of a problem with um, data looking odd, because until May, you can see the data are quite nice. They follow some sort of pattern. There are individual patient lines and there is average line for the unit, you know, which is also important. If you want to demonstrate, I found through bitter experience that you really never want to explain these things. That's why I created also another thingy here, which is to um, to write to tidy the data. Da -da 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 -da. Right, let me just see if I can stop sharing screen for just one second. Yeah, and if there are any interesting questions, they can come up, but I will simply change one thing. Yes, I will change a reset demo factor to yes, and that's done in the properties file. And now what we should do, we should Share the screen again. OK. Yeah, here we are. Now the process is going to take longer, but what it is doing in the back of it, it is simply sourcing the second file and that second file is looking at the uh, data. Where in this demo data set. What is the last date of the demo data set? Then it uh, kind of gives, yes, you can see what it has done. It has basically cut off all the results and it has also brought in the result set to more recent. For example, the most recent result is seven days before today. Yeah, and that's quite important because when you show this to people, you really want them to uh, be able to feel that the thing is really recent. And that's the other bit which is particular to this particular thing. And this particular thing is also freely available on GitHub in my repo, so you can replicate everything you want from here. Now let me talk lastly a little bit about where I see this fits in, where I have found it quite helpful. So the model, as you can see, is this. There is Lime Survey server somewhere on the internet here, and here is our NHS laptop, etc. Yeah. Of course, we all know that we never must put any confidential data somewhere outside NHS, which is with good reason. Yeah. This uh, was a relatively sort of extreme example. We were asking mental health patients what was happening to them, and I ran it uh, past my trust's information governance in the previous trust where I worked, and they said it's perfectly fine. Yeah. So what we are doing, we are having an Excel file where there is a patient population, and R simply assigns one-way hash, which is created from uh, the Rio number. Yeah. So that is our sort of secret key table which joins real ID to uh, this one-way hash. 
and this one way hash we tag on onto the uh, survey because when we are building our survey and maybe I should show you what it looks like because it could be interesting so let's go back to Lime survey and let's go for the demo survey demo here yeah here is this demo which you just seen so the structure obviously has the main group it has the main rating question and then it has this slider uh, sorry no this multiple numeric input as you could see they both are multiple numeric inputs. The first one simply had slider enabled and had only one sub question under it. The second one was, uh, you know, about a &E, police contacts and crisis team. It simply had three sub questions. But the most interesting thing here is this question responder ID record, because that responder ID record that is a hidden question. Yeah, if we edit it, we could see somewhere that it is always hidden. I think it's under here. Da, 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 da. Always hides this question on. Yeah. So the question is there, but at the same time, it is invisible. Um, and we populate this invisible question through uh, the barcode, of course. And let's just decode this barcode. So for example, this, okay, let's open it. Yeah, so you can see here up on top, this is how you standard access a survey. And if you access it without any get parameters afterwards, yeah, in that case, you would fill out this question and that secret question would not have been filled out. Here you can see question 003 ID I want to assign it this value, 121212, which is the secret number. And that's how we get to populate our, our, our thing. That's how we get to distinguish one patient's answers from, from another. Now, I was told that this is actually good enough method because A, we are not putting any actual patient identifying information. We are just putting some numbers together with some sort of ID from which no one can derive actually real number because it was a one way hash. Now, second bit is that Lime survey, because they also are quite mature, etc. They also can encrypt the answers as well. That encryption method has some drawbacks because if someone really attacked the web server, then they could get both encryption keys. But uh, I think they are now working little by little on actually having the only the public key on the server and the private key you would have you would have the ability to keep it to yourself. So the answers would be stored in database in encrypted format and only would be decrypted locally if you if you ever wanted to. But and that can be done here in R. You can just pull down the answers and then decrypt and analyze them as you please. So that's about Lime survey. Was there anything else? Yes, a couple more things. Really, dealing with patient sort of related information, it's not the most sort of useful thing because of confidentiality things and so on. You have to basically jump through hoops quite a lot in order to be able to do something, but you can. Other things you can just use in your daily work for some sort of daily polls or something. You could, let's say, embed, uh, for example, there is a web server Okay, sorry, psych. Yeah, and here, for example, clearly that website I did actually make myself. It wasn't very difficult. Here is please ask questions link. Yeah, so that goes to Lime survey and I can get uh, the questions asking thing and exactly it has a hidden thing which comes from the page properties 
which basically says, OK, I know which page this question came from. And let's see if there are bits. Probably because trainees actually have put in their names, etc. I think it wouldn't be a good idea for me to um, to kind of display these these things because they are recorded. But what I'm trying to say is you can make very clean, uh, you know, PDF report of any kind from Lime survey and this Cloud R um, Limer is the library which helps you do that. Phew, I think I'll stop here. I think I have said most of what I wanted to say. Any questions? <clears throat> Sorry, I think my internet has gone a bit strange. Oh, but I can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me, so maybe it's all fine, actually. Um, there's no questions in the chat. I've got a question. Yeah. Um, which is, um, you mentioned about the one-way hash, and I've yep. thought about doing that in the past, because obviously it's quite a powerful technique to link data. Yep. Can you just talk about exactly what algorithm you used and how you kind of convinced IG that it was kind of all secure and, and safe? I simply referred them to, uh, I used, honestly, I just chose algorithm which was, uh, has been around. I even forgot which exact algorithm I chose at the moment, but that's something that I could look into. But uh, as long as it's possible to convey to them that there is really no way how to recompute the Rio number or NHS number, you know, uh, that should be fine. Because that's a key idea of one way hashes, you know, in cryptography. So. Uh. OK, yeah, cool. Um, I mean, I don't know much about it. I think um, I've read some scary things about kind of rainbow tables and all this sort of. Um... Rainbow tables are basically pre-computed passwords with permutations and so on, and that's how it how it goes. But hashes are really not vulnerable to, because uh, rainbow tables say, as far as I know, they are really kind of dependent on uh, uh, people doing kind of silly things. Yeah, but if you go with a valid kind of well-researched sort of algorithm, which there are probably about I don't know at least twenty to pick from, I, I think then you are quite fine. Okay, cool. There is another thing which I wanted to mention. As you saw, I was showing only sort of numeric responses. Numeric responses are very good for two reasons. One reason is you can make nice graphs from them, okay, that everybody loves. But the second reason is this. Um, I have no control what people submit as text responses. So let's say if there was among mental health patients, and I certainly hope there isn't uh, such a case, you know, but if there was a situation where a person decided to use it as a means of communication and would say something along the lines, you know, and by the way, I'm kind of thinking actually about ending my life and I'm actually about one day away and just wanted you to know. Because people could enter it in any sort of free text form. Yeah. And that's, first of all, that's one reason. Secondly, they could also put in, my name is Jack Daniels or whatever. Yeah, they could put in their real name, address or address of their neighbor. So I really, even with one way hash, I wouldn't really want to offer people free text responses. It's a completely different matter if I ask people to give feedback on uh, the quality of teaching or if I ask people to read some articles and write some questions about those articles for me you know, which I have done through those links, and then ability to produce a quick report, which you have predefined in R, is really very, very good. You know, every week you go to do some sort of teaching. I spend uh, literally five minutes in printing out that sheet with the newest questions, and then I can address the questions in class. Or if I've done a presentation, and I'm sorry I didn't have time to prepare that for today, I could ask people simply submit their ratings, and then I can display their ratings and questions right at the end of the presentation. So, yep. 
Yeah, it's the problem I'm familiar with from, uh, I work with a lot of patient experience data and we have the same problem is that people are not supposed to put, um, we don't ask for any identifying information, but yeah. people are obviously free to, and they sometimes will talk about clinical care and they will talk about lots of things. Um, so that can be yeah. problematic. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, okay, there's no questions in the chat, I don't think. So if anyone has got any questions, please put them in the chat. I've got another question, uh, which was, I just wondered, um, you were talking about um, encryption and decryption of data with R. Yeah. I wonder if you could just say a bit more about how that works. Yes. Uh, so let me, yep. So, okay, I'll, I'll show, basically, for every question, you can choose to encrypt the data as well. Yeah, let's go to when it's on screen. I'll just show that to you. Mm -hmm. And let me go to the forum as well. Yes. My topics. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. These are two things. So let me share the screen again. Okay. Here we are. This is our webinar thing. And I think, yeah, edit the question. So there is a possibility to um, encrypt the thing on question by question basis. Yeah, let me just hold on. Now, I wanted to show also that there was because basically the way how encryption works at the moment yeah and it's quite well uh, it explained in this thing which i'll probably post in the chat would perhaps that would be the best thing so that people i'll post it in the chat so um every question you could encrypt yeah because lime survey has also um for example, it has responses. Yeah, you can display these responses and you can download those responses. Now, obviously, if you display responses, yeah, then you have to then you have to have. Uh, So let's submit our first response and let's see how it looks. Yeah. So survey responses is here. If you just want to display responses, it's here and you can see I have said hello and I have answered 61. Yeah. That's the way how it's displayed in Lime survey interface. I usually really am not very interested in that. It's very seldom except for some quick checking that I would use this part. I'm much more interested in getting those data straight from Lime Survey into a data frame and then doing whatever I want with them. Yeah. Now here, so that you can see hello on screen, if the question were encrypted, you would still see hello on screen, which means that the question is decrypted by Lime Survey so that it can display it to you. Yeah. And I would see it as a security vulnerability. And that's why I raised a sort of bug report with them, which they actually are considering implementing. And here I'm kind of talking about it. And we talk quite in detail about this, this problem. Yeah. And I'm telling them that um, if I wanted things to be really secure, yeah, I would need a second method of encryption, which would only encrypt things with a public key because in encryption there is public and private key sort of thing so you can encrypt something with a public key 
and no one can read it without private key. So because Lime Survey can actually display this hello to us, even though it is encrypted, yeah, it means that it has decrypted it. It means that Lime Survey has uh, the private key available, which I really don't want. I would rather see garbage here instead of hello, download this data locally and decrypt with pub private key, which I only have locally, and that would be that. Yeah. And this kind of discussion is uh, quite uh, well described here. So that would be the link which I will post in response to that query. Anything else that I can? Yeah, that's really nice. It's really nice that they're um, so responsive, as you say, and you've had such a good conversation um, <clears throat> on that. Um, yeah. So that's that's obviously a really nice um, open source kind of community around that particular one. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. If anybody wants to raise anything. Sorry for being boring. <laughs> well, it was very comprehensive. I think that's what I was thinking. Um, I pretty much just ask you about the security bits because I don't know. Um, it's not something I know a huge amount about. Um, I have got one final question, actually, which is um, so you mentioned about the, the, the package. I can't remember what it's called. Um, yeah. Can you just talk about kind of what what kind of heavy lifting that package does and what you know, what's left over to be done? You're what talking you about this one, that? right? Yeah, what's it called? R, is it, oh, Lime R, that's it, yeah, Lime, Lime R. yeah. Lime R. Well, R, that I think is actually quite important. Let me show you that, you know, because in Lime Survey installation, yeah, you have configuration and um, you have global configuration and you have interfaces. So RPC, remote procedure call interface enabled json rpc it is something that's quite important yeah and that's accessible through this url okay so with the correct information through this url you can use uh, lime survey provided apis which are actually quite well described in the api site but what this library does is basically makes use of those APIs and only requiring from you your LAMP survey installation remote control, username and password. So that user is just a read only user to which I never allow any sort of write access unless to some surveys. For example, here I needed write access to be able to update those responses. Yeah, as you saw. And then it explains how to use it. So this is a really good way how you can, A, you can simply get responses, which is the main thing that's implemented here. But if you use any other uh, Lime Survey API calls, which you can do, then you can modify the data, you can fill out the surveys, etc., etc. You can even, I think, create a new survey. I mean, I wouldn't go to that length, but as you could see, it was really quite handy to use this to um, to just uh, make something which resets the demo, da de demo data. Yeah, that's very interesting. So I can imagine writing the data. You could potentially, I mean, it might be it was probably over engineered for most purposes. But for example, there might be times when you've got a shiny application. Yeah. And you may potentially want to feed information from that, so you could write API calls from there, couldn't you? Definitely, definitely. That's perfectly doable. Yeah. Oh, OK. Well, I still can't see any questions in the chat. I think everyone's being very quiet. Um, so thank you very much. It was very um, useful. As I say, I was put off using this some time ago because I was too intimidated by how complex it was, but you've explained it beautifully. Um, so thank you again for your contribution to the webinar series. Um, we'll be back um, next month uh, with another one um, to be TBC. Um, please watch uh, for updates and um, just want to just do a very quick reminder. We are open for abstracts for the NHSR community conference. The closing date is on Friday. Um, I haven't um, managed to get the link in the chat because I've been too distracted watching the program and I'm just realizing that as I'm talking, um, which is unfortunate. So I'm just going to just stall momentarily while I find it and pop it in the chat. Here it is. 
So please fill that out by Friday. R and Python together on the main stage. Long talks, short talks, workshops, we're open for everything. Um, so I'd like to thank Robert very much again, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thanks very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you.